Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Husna Mushaka. Husna is interested in paleobotany, paleoecology, paleoenvironments, and community archaeology. Currently a PhD student in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change in the Institute of Human Origins at Arizona State University, she holds a BA in Heritage Management from the University of Dar es Salaam and a master's degree from the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Nairobi, Kenya. She's a research leader with the Kondoa Deep History Partnership, along with Dr. Catherine Ranhorn at Arizona State University and a graduate assistant at the Kobe Fora Field School. Please join me in welcoming Husna as she gives her talk, Vegetation Reconstruction During the Holocene Period in East Turkana Basin Using Phytolith Analysis. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, okay. Okay, as Martha said, uh, my name is Husna Mashaka, PhD student uh, at Arizona State University. So I'm going to present my work and this work was for my master's. Um, it's about environmental reconstruction of Holocene vegetation in East Africa to uh, in East Turkana. So introduction, like uh, we all know like, okay, during the Holocene period, clim uh, there was a climatic change, dramatic climatic change uh, from, from uh, shifting from water condition to dry condition. Uh, so even people changed their subsistence uh, from fish and other lake resources to domestication. So in uh, Kubifora, uh, there is a domestic, uh, this pastoralist group, the Dasnach, they still live in that place. And these people have a tendency of moving from one place to another, seasonal. So they have specific place they move, like during the dry season, during the wet season, uh, to search for green, uh, greener pasture for their animals. So these people, when they move, so this, the first photo, this photo shows like how, when they live, like they have these bombers, the bombers, uh, they live like with the animals inside, uh, but in a different place. So they have these houses and they have the cattle enclosures. So these people, when they move after, uh, maybe during the rain season, uh, some vegetation starts to grow, which are different from outside. Uh, so there's this dif uh, different signature of vegetation inside bombers that you won't find outside bombers. So this that was in, Lake Tulkana and two sites, Ilerate and Karari. And samples were collected uh, in uh, different places and this map shows all the places I collected samples. So for this tag, I used phytolith. Uh, phytolith are silica cells formed when silica is deposited around or within cells and form, uh, form cells, cell lip replicas or cast through transpiration. So this is how the phytolith form in a leaf or uh, in a bark. So they form in a different place of in a plant. So this is how they form. It's like the epidermal of cells. So when a plant dies or uh, decays, this phytolith, they separate and preserve in a soil for long, long, long time. These are some of the uh, species, the plant species you find inside bombers and that you won't find it outside bombers. Uh, the objectives of this study was to understand the correlation between phytolith assemblages and above ground vegetation cover, uh, to assess vegetation cover changes in Kobifora during the Holocene, uh, to explain the impact of humans and climate on vegetation change. Uh, the methods I, and materials, uh, vegetation data. So I was uh, identifying, tallied, and recorded 
vegetation inside and uh, outside bombers. Um, so I was looking to different species which represent more inside and which one represent more outside. Uh, dung samples are used. Uh, so some people use modern vegetation. They take maybe leaves, uh, roots. Uh, they burn and use the ashes for to check the modern like if the modern vegetation represents the maybe past vegetation. But for me, I use cow dung, uh, sheep, donkey because these are the domesticated animals by the dust snatch. Uh, so I use dung to see if they represent what I see from the soil. Uh, soil sample, I collected samples, uh, soil from inside and outside to compare. And outside, uh, it was 0 0.5 kilometer away, so to avoid contamination. Also, I collected uh, samples uh, from Holocene sites, early Holocene and mid Holocene to see, uh, to compare the modern vegetation I see and the uh, early and Holocene, uh, early, early and mid Holocene samples if there is any vegetation changes. So these samples were proce processed. Uh, I used cuts at HAL 2010. So this method uh, insists on using less chemicals. Uh, sometimes they're not good for health. Uh, also, I did the uh, microscopic identification. So, phytolith uh, uh, we identified uh, identified according to their morphological features and uh, or their taxonomic affiliation. Uh, classified using the international codes of phytolith nomenclature and uh, on identification, there is different uh, shapes. So, I used. Uh, Norman 2019, Madela, Stromberg, Twist, Twe et al. 1969, and special for grass phytolith. So these are my results. Mm. So when we recorded uh, and tallied the vegetation, so from uh, inside bombers, so like from, for example, Boma F. Leptotherium senegalis, senegalens uh, had a 31% and amaranthes uh, 10%. In control transect cypera species, 26%. Uh, Duosperma, 23%. Solanum, 10 And Plosopis and listeners. So these two, they represent uh, human uh, occupation like they they are a signature of human uh what human disturbance or human occupation of that place so you you won't find these uh plants in so many places uh away from humans say like, like most around where human lives so these are some of the vegetation uh samples of the vegetation that's occurred or are mostly abundant in before. So from what I observed, uh, the grasses and herbs have high diversity, especially inside bombers uh, compared to outside bombers and outside more trees. And this is also for Ferrari. So, Abacious grassland is the most prominent with Boma F control transect uh, with uh, greater than 8, 28% occurrence in all bombers. Uh, wood vegetation is in an occupied site. And these are the results from Karari. Abacious grassland are the most prominent within bombers with 40% occurrence in all bombers. And while you find uh, wood trees, uh, you find wood, this one, like more prominent outside, but when you look at inside, you find they are very low. So phytolith samples, um, the samples are from the dung, from goat, donkey, and cows. So they show um, wood lycot is more prominent in donkeys, dung because of the feeding habit of the donkey. Uh, sometimes they dig 
through the soil and eat the roots, uh, which when you start the uh, dung from donkey and goat and cow, there is a difference because uh, the donkey dung looks like you're studying soil. So for cow and goat, you find more of grasses and herbs than trees. So the same as inside. Uh, so here we collected, uh, this is from Keto Enclosure. Uh, from Keto Enclosure and homogeneous uh, deposition, we wanted to see uh, how the different representation from different uh, places. So from the Keto Enclosure is where mostly vegetation uh, start to grow. Uh, there is a little of uh, wood, Dicot, but homogeneous, I think because of the, we collected in so many places and it was like, a, so it has a high wood dicot uh, compared in deposition is where most of the, uh, all the materials are deposited in one place. Yeah, so for outside bombers, you see the bars for wood dicot is very high. Uh, compared to what we saw uh, from the outside, inside bombers. So the same from Karari, um, wood dicot is very high, uh, but more uh, herbs, grasses. Uh, also outside from Karari, the wood dicot is very high, but uh, grasses, herbs, and others are very high compared to. So early Holocene. Um, for this one, uh, we collected in two sites, Lower Sela in FXDJ 108 or area 117. So at the top layer, you find wood dicot is very, very high. But when you go down, would they could start to uh, to decrease? Uh, same as when you see the um, herbs, uh, grasses, uh, they are very like when you see here at the top of at the bottom, uh, grasses are very high compared to to here. Even the panicoid and corridoid, they are very high at the bottom compared to the uh, upper layers. So for mid Holocene uh, also uh, it shows uh, grasses uh, are very high than compared to wood dicot. Um, also there is uh, this the presence of uh, arrested grasses, which you want, uh, it's very hard to find on the modern uh, samples. So these are some of the phytolith I, I saw from the microscopic uh, identification. And this is rondel, this is short grass, short grass cells, and this is sage phytolith. And this is bulliform. The bulliforms are phytolith that cannot give you the signature of uh, C3 or C4, but they're from grasses and they represent water uh, uh, water source. Then this is verocasphere, but also I saw non-vegetational uh, signature, phytolith. Uh, this is datums from water, and most was more prominent uh, in samples from lower cellar because uh, this, I think the site was under water. So to, to understand the climate, the aridity and which one between the grasses and wood dominated in that place. So we used phytolith index and the IPH index is aridity index, and all samples show high dominance of chloridate grass, indicating high aridity, 
because when the chloridoid grass are very high, then it indicates the place is high aridity. For example, uh, fire pit samples indicate high aridity value of 0 0.5, while pest control indicates low aridity. Uh, and this is most like the pest control was bumped after a rain season, which had more panicoid phytolith in the dung, while the fire pit one was bumped during the dry season. Uh, <clears throat> on the part of the pest control, they does not have this tendency of uh, burning, uh, like to control the pests. So they burn the areas where the these kettles uh, live uh, in kettle enclosures. So we collected sample from fire pit and the pest control to see the representation. So deep, uh, DP, this uh, uh, indicates which one is high between grass and wood. And so all samples indicate a low wood phytolith. Uh, vegetation cover shifted to less grassland with a few panicoid and prolidoid with rare aristine. So as I said, like uh, most samples, the early and mid Holocene, uh, aristide is very uh, common, but very rare at the modern times. Uh, burnt phytolith observed more uh, wood deriv delivered with correlated correlates, which correlates with the microcharcoal observed. Uh, uh, this indicates human activities. Uh, conclusion. So the phytolith data correlate with the vegetation on the above ground. A baseless grass and environment with a mix of few trees in all bombers, grass and herbs have high diversity than other species, while wood species are more outside. So assessment of the changes in vegetation cover in Kubifola, the data indicate, indicated that uh, indicate that there has been a sig significant variation in vegetation cover in Kubifora during the Holocene. Uh, human activities have positively impacted vegetation change. Uh, the social cultural practices have significantly influenced the dynamic in vegetation cover, particularly within this isolated uh, bombers area. So microchark observed and plant phytoid that there is a of human activities. Um, so for, for, for the microcharcoal, uh, the samples were collected from the fire pits. Uh, most of them shows uh, wood, uh, wood phytolith than the grass phytolith. The, the grass phytolith are very low and probably to where it was used for uh, starting the fire, but wood was used for cooking. But most of them are indicated uh, wood, uh, like uh, dry wood. So thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We can now begin the question and answer section. The question and answer section will be open to voice questions as well as written questions. If you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand in the nonverbal controls present underneath the participant panel, and I will send you a request to unmute. If you prefer to ask a written question that is also still possible, you can do so using the Zoom chat module, and as usual, I will read out the question. Please remember that the webinars are recorded so that if you ask a question, this will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. Go ahead, Bonnie. Thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. It's not, not nothing I would ever imagine myself looking at these little bitty phytoliths, but it's, that's really cool. Uh, uh, first question is, uh, when, you, when you interview people about what the animals eat, does that match what you find in the dung? So do you find that the oral testimony would be a really good, um, you know, or, or are there things that people don't know that their animals are eating, for instance? And then the second is, uh, do you have some ideas on why the Aristida species became mm -hmm. so much less abundant in more recent times? Okay. Uh, so for the interview I did, asking about the uh, like what animal eats or what they don't eat, yeah, uh, they, they relate with the phytolith I see. Because uh, they say, like, uh, when a rain, when uh, during the rain season, the first uh, plants to to grow, most some of them, uh, even the uh, the kettles, they don't eat. So, in there are some plants like the kettles or the cows dung, 
they don't eat. Uh, it's different with donk. Donkey eats an anything. That's why you find it like healthy all the time. But for cows and <laughs> sheep, like it's different. There are some plants they don't eat. Uh, some are poisonous and some uh, like not for, for them. Like it's not health for them. So they, they might eat when there's no uh, other plants, but does not add anything for their health. And for the arrested to, like, why is different from uh, early and mid Holocene and not now? It's because of the climate, climate, like the from wetter to drier season. So the more it's becoming drier, the arrested uh, disappear. Well, I, I just remember the name Aristide from the Kalahari, so I thought it was in a lot of really dry places, but I guess there's a lot of different types of it, most likely. So mm -hmm. um, that just surprised me that it wouldn't do well in the dry area or, or disturbed areas. Um, uh, okay, I, I can say because of the vegetation, they adapt different in different uh, places. And, also, they like they differ in in terms of areas. So, like uh, some you find them in dry, some you find them in a, a wet environment. So, for, for uh, the case of Kobil Fora is because of the trending drier, like it's becoming now like humid or yeah, that's why they added it. They arrested is not present at the moment. If nobody else has a question, I'll ask another, which is there must be some phytoliths that look the same, like you can't tell certain species apart. Like if there were a phytolith you wish you could tell apart, what would that be? I think for most of them now, I, I know. OK, there is um, like uh, similarities between close phytolith and bilobed phytolith. So you, you have to concentrate on the lobes because they differ uh, in lobes and they are the they time thing here, like the west <laughs> or the uh, between the bilobates and the cross. Yeah, those are, they look kind of similar, but not similar, you have to, check the, you have to be very careful with the lobes because the cross looks like a cross and, but sometimes you find some of them looks like by lobes, so. So if I understood correctly, the bomas are uh, like areas for where animals graze, essentially. Do I understand that correctly? Uh, so bomas are pastoralist homestead. Okay. But the way they build it, like they live with the uh, animals, like the place for uh, animals and there's place for people. So it's like a huge, uh, what, homestead, yeah. Um, so I guess I was wondering about, I noticed that one of the differences inside and outside of the bombas had to do with the number of trees. And I guess I wondered if the, Bomas were selected by people because they had a lot of grasses for their animals to uh, No. So when they select these places, it's like a bear, like the first photo I showed, like it's like a, there's no grasses or any anything. So, but they select the places uh, uh, seasonally. They have specific place for dry season because they know like, uh, maybe in few meters or few kilometers, they find grasses for, for their cattle. Uh, also, they select maybe uh, during the wet season or rain season. So they know like uh, there's availability of water uh, close by. Yeah, so like they select in different periods and there's no grass like inside the bombers, but when they leave, uh, after rain season, we find more grasses inside, especially in cattle enclosures. But after, when like the drier, when it becomes drier, the species becomes less. So you find more during the rain season, but when it becomes drier, like there's less species, especially mm -hmm. inside Boma. So, but the uh, the soil becomes nutrients the nutrients from the cow dung. So like when it rains, the vegetation starts again, but when it becomes drier, the 
heat and they dry. Yeah. And funny enough, like this time, uh, even the vegetation species change. Like last time I went, like I knew like <laughs> there are some specific plants you find inside. And now it's like different. You find the amaranthus that is edible. And even the dust nuts, some of them were taking the edible to eat. So yeah, they keep changing. And you won't find it outside bombers, only inside. I, I was wondering that, so I looked up the prosopis, which you said was much more common in the bomas, that that's an invasive uh, plant um, from the Americas. Do we really know when that arrived in Africa? Uh, I don't know when, and they're not specifically inside bomas, but around the areas where people live. So uh, I don't know when, maybe I'll sh I should check on that. Because I don't imagine it was brought intentionally, but just... Mm -hmm accidentally mm -hmm. uh okay so i know these nurse communities are very common especially in town areas than the cobifora but they, they're present but they are not so so many and even i at first time i was like wow so i can find this uh tree here and not in in town only so okay there's a question in the chat um, from Katie, Katie Ranhorn. Can you talk a bit about how areas in Kondoa, like around Disa, will compare to the BOMA study for studying plant change over time in terms of human impact? Uh, okay, so I think for the case of Kondoa, it's different uh, with the Kubifora, because Kubifora is more of a uh, these pastoralist activities contributing to these changes, like you see the difference of vegetation. But for Kondoa, the only thing I can say from now, like it's from observation, uh, not literature or anything. It's like uh, there is a big shift in vegetation. Um, they say like around, I think, 1950s or during the colonial period, like. There was a time people were given land, like you maybe to, yeah, to start your houses. So they burnt uh, grasses because it was like, from the observation from the photos, it's grasses in 1956, but now it's trees, like it's forest. So <laughs> I can't explain much, but I can say uh, maybe the soil uh, changed because of the burning of vegetation because the soil chemists maybe now accommodate more of uh, the trees than uh, grasses or yeah, there's so many <laughs> that should be done. So yeah, but uh, human uh, play some part because they tend to, they do this, um, they burn trees for charcoal. Uh, they go to these reserve areas and cut trees. So like everything is changing and you see like the human contribute to these changes, but I can say in scientific way because I haven't thought yet. Are there final lists of the different uh, tubers like the Vigna species? Yeah, so, okay. Fight on it, they give you, they are very good at telling the grasses, especially C3 and C4, but they can't tell you about the trees, like which specific trees. So, um, like more, maybe you add with the you, pollen. So, cause pollen, they give you the specific uh, tree. Yeah, I'm thinking about like in the Hadza, former Hadza areas that used to have a lot of vinya or mm -hmm. tuber vine of different uh, species that might not be called vinya anymore. That's the name I know from 30 years ago, um, mm -hmm. where people create, took away a lot of the trees to make charcoal. And now mm -hmm. those, the areas are not good for finding very much mm -hmm. in the tubers anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so that, yeah, I think of silica being more like, especially like, yeah, grasses and horsetails and things like that, having a lot of yeah, silica. You, 
Yeah, you can find even the wood uh, and the good signature of the uh, of the burning is when the like you may find the phytolith like burning phytolith and this does not happen like itself like the phytolith burn so you find like some people started fire but uh, to understand fire like is it human or is it natural then you have to see the charcoals the size of the charcoals and yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would, so is it uh, so fruits and nuts would would they have silica would they have phytolith in them or was that only in the like the stems? Um, mm -hmm, they have. Could you actually tell the difference between like whether a place was being processed for a lot of the the let's say a, a plant with a lot of seeds versus just that the plant was there versus somebody I don't know I don't even know what I'm asking but <laughs> you know that they're. So you could tell somebody uh, ate a lot of fruit there, say, as opposed to just mm. there was a tree there. Mm, yeah, I, I I think you can tell, but was so the phytolith in the fruit would look, look different than the phytolith in the stem then of, mm -hmm. of the same species. Wow. Yeah, because some uh, even for they are phytolith specific for uh, cereals. Sorry, I keep asking questions. Are there a lot of species that you had to determine what the phytolith looked like yourself, or was that in the literature already? Uh, yeah, we call it a uh, phytolith. <laughs> okay, I call it phytolith uh, Bible. So we have this book that leads us uh, sometimes because you you won't uh, understand which one it is. So yeah. Yeah, and uh, the good thing is some of them you might see, but it's different from what you, from the others. So you, you know, like this is contamination. This is not originally here. Cause mm -hmm. phytolith, they have this, um, like they define places like in dry, uh, dry seas, uh, dry areas. They have a specific shape because of this maintaining water. And so if you find, uh, and also specific plant, so if I find palm, uh, phytolith in a place that there is no palm, so definitely it's contamination or something else. And may maybe you find one, so it won't tell anything. So, yeah. Thank you. I think those are all of the questions and comments for today. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. I would like to thank Lusna again for her presentation and everyone else for participating today, and I hope to see you again at our next webinar on Wednesday the 20th of September by Jeremy Coburn.